Alrighty, so we've been speaking so far about carbohydrates as chains of carbon atoms. Uh, and, and these are chains of carbon atoms that feature an aldehyde or, or a ketone functional group. And that falls into this general kind of 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And of course, I'll keep using uh, glucose as an example. Now, I've also used the term polyhydroxylated to, uh, to refer to the numerous hydroxyl groups that are in these carbohydrates. And really, I bring all of this verbiage back up to hopefully spark your ability to see that carbohydrates have all the makings of an internal or, or intramolecular, I guess, reaction between the carbinyl carbon right here and one of the hydroxyl groups. Because essentially what we have is, is carbinyl and alcohol chemical reactions just kind of waiting to happen. And what happens when an alcohol nucleophile attacks an aldehyde or a ketone? Well, you, you know, if there's an excess of alcohol, we end up with a product that is either an acetal or a ketal. But what happens if there's only one nucleophilic attack by an alcohol? If we just have one alcohol, and, and that's going to be the case in the ring-closing intramolecular reaction we have going on here. Well, in that case, we end up with a hemiacetal or a hemiketal. And really, that terminology is just kind of a review of acetal and ketal uh, chemical reactions that would fall under, I guess, if you're looking in an organic chemistry book, uh, aldehyde or ketone reactions, probably in the carbonyl section. So let's show how this process is happening in the context of our glucose over here. First, I'm, I'm going to highlight the particular hydroxyl oxygen that's going to act as the nucleophile. So we'll make that pink. And after being deprotonated, so after losing, after losing this proton, this oxygen is going to have an extra set of electrons right here. And those electrons are going to target that carbonyl carbon. So I'll draw the, the carbonyl carbon in green. And remember uh, that the carbonyl carbon has a partial positive charge on it. It has a partial positive charge because a lot of the electron density in this bond, double bond is being hogged by this oxygen. So the oxygen has a partially negative charge and the carbonyl carbon is partially positive and that makes it a perfect target for the nucleophile that's uh, been created in the deprotonation process of this oxygen. And so after the oxygen's electrons attack this carbonyl carbon, what's going to happen is, is these the electrons from this double bond are going to kind of kick back up to the, to the uh, oxygen up here and eventually they're going to attract another proton and will form another hydroxyl group out of some of the electrons from that bond. Now you might be asking, and it's a, a perfectly valid question, why it's this particular oxygen, the one that I've highlighted, that's acting as the nucleophile. And you're going to see, as soon as I get the product drawn, that we've formed a six-member ring. So it really has a lot to do with product stability. And if you remember, the, the basis for the formation of the ring in the first place was the, the increased stability over the straight carbon chain. So it makes sense that we're going to form the most stable ring that we can. Now when we end up with a six-membered carbohydrate ring, such as the case with glucose here, we call the product a pyranose. Pyranose, uh, the os again as a suffix for sugar, and then the pyr part for to indicate that this ring is, is uh, sugar with six carbons. And then if, if the carbohydrate ring is a five carbon ring, we call it a furanose, which is a bit easier for me to remember because furanose and five both start with the letter F. So that's kind of the, the memory jogger for me. And maybe a good example for that would be ribose with its five carbon chain. But I'll kind of stop there because almost every ring forming carbohydrate that I can think of with, with biological implications at least forms either a five or a six membered ring. So pyranoses and, and furanoses. So just by convention, you can see that I've placed the O in this corner up here. And that places the formerly carbonyl carbon down here right below it. And it's actually no longer the carbonyl carbon, but it's still significant because it's the only carbon here that is bonded to two oxygen atoms, the, the highlighted oxygen. And it's bonded to another hydroxyl group as well. So I'll keep it distinguished in color. And we also distinguish its name now as the anomeric carbon. So that's the anomeric 
carbon. And then we can go ahead and, and fill in the rest of the substituents in the diagram. So a hydroxyl group and another and another. And we call this diagram a Haworth diagram. So Haworth diagram. And the Haworth diagram doesn't show us the actual configuration of the ring because in reality, you know, six-membered rings are going to show up in a more stable chair shape. But it is beneficial in telling us which substituents are above or below the ring. So to keep this convention straight in my mind, I remember the phrase downright uplifting. So downright uplifting, kind of a play on, on I guess, the phrase that's downright uplifting, but downright uplifting because as I fill in the substituents, those on the right side of the Fisher diagram will point down and those on the, on the left side of the Fisher diagram are going to point up. So we can actually see that. That one's up and we'll make sure that this number is off right. This one's up as well and it, maybe we'll name this or maybe we'll start numbering with one, two, three, four, five, six. And we can do that over here. This would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So our three carbon in the Haworth diagram is pointed up, and our three uh, carbon on the on the um, Fisher diagram has its uh, substituent on the left. So down, right, up, left. And as we get to the last carbon group, which kind of forms this tail down here, I remember that if it's a D sugar, that group is going to point up in the Hayworth or in the Haworth, excuse me, projection. So this is a D sugar, and you can see in the Haworth projection that this last carbon points up as well. And really this is going to be the case for a lot of sugar chemistry that you deal with because again we're enzymatically programmed to digest D sugars so we often end up with this last group pointing up. Now the last thing I want to show you is the chair conformation. So the chair conformation and that's because this, this is the kind of diagram that's going to give us a sense for the actual configuration of, of D glucose, but it really does just follow the, follow suit with the Haworth projection as far as the substituents being above or below the ring. So let me just kind of keep filling in the substituents here and I'll, uh, I'll number them off again just so you can kind of uh, see that there's some consistency here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, this three carbon right here is the only one with the hydroxyl group pointing up. And I guess I better change the color of our one carbon to keep that consistent as well. Now, I didn't indicate the, the position of the anomeric carbon's hyd hydroxyl group yet be because I, I think it makes more sense to show it in this diagram. Rem remember, uh, excuse me, that the original nucleophilic attack by the oxygen uh, way back over here, that could have created two different products, one with an R configuration about the anomeric carbon and the other with the S configuration. So that last hydroxyl group can actually be in two different positions. On one hand, the hydroxyl group would be cis to the last carbon in the, in the equatorial position. So it'd be cis to this last carbon over here, and it's in the equatorial position position and we call this the beta anomer. Then on the on the other hand I guess it could be trans to that last carbon group which would place it in the axial position down here. So I guess it could be down here in the axial position and we call it the alpha anomer when the when the hydroxyl group is in the axial. And I kind of remember that a little bit easier. Alpha for the, the axial position of that substituent. And I guess I've also heard that fishies are down in the sea and birds are up in the air. So if that helps you keep them straight, you, you might be able to use that also. Now you've got to remember that what caused this ring to close in the first place was some amount of, of acid or base. And the um, amount of acid and base in water is actually kind of capable of doing that because that's what facilitated this ring closing process in the first place. And in water, the ring can actually open and close spontaneously. And when it opens up, the, the C1 and C2 bond right here can actually rotate 
and when it closes again, you can form the either the alpha or the beta product. So this thing is constantly opening and opening and closing um, to, to form the two different products. And we call that process where it opens and rotates and closes again, mutarotation. So this thing is mutarotating in the water at all times. So mutarotation. And the outcome is that we end up with both configurations, the beta and the alpha, in the equilibrium concentration. So for glucose, that's going to be about 36% alpha and about 64% beta. And the reason that the alpha uh, configuration is less favored in equilibrium for glucose is because the transpositioning of the hydroxyl group creates some steric hindrance. But this is pretty individualized for different sugars. So I guess the most general rule, I suppose, that you could apply to all cyclic sugars would be to say that the beta anomer, uh, again, anomer, that the beta anomer uh, is the one with the anomeric oxygen in the cis position with respect to the last carbon.